Hey everyone, this is Alex Lindsay sitting in for Leo as he's on the cruise. I'm here with Andy Anotko, Justin Williams, and Aaron Hillegas. And we're going to be talking about publishing for the iPad, magazines and books, and some of the kinks in between. We're going to talk about Macworld. And also we talk about how to get your unlimited plan back from AT&T. All that and more. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 232 for Tuesday, February 1st, 2011. Free Cowboy Hats. This episode of MacBreak is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle the used gadgets lying around your home or office. Don't just sell it, Gazelle it. For 5% bonus payment on your used gadgets, go to gazelle.com and use the bonus code MacBreak. And by Carbonite. Backing up files on your PC or Mac is safe and easy with Carbonite. For a free trial plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com and use the offer code MacBreak. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to Audible.com slash MacBreak. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to MacBreak. This is Alex sitting in for Leo, who is by this time on his way. He's on a plane. I don't think he's on the ship yet, but he is... Uh, he is getting very close to being on his big cruise. I'm so jealous he's going down there. Of course, the only thing is I have to say is that I, is that I saw one of the big cruise liners on dry dock down by Revision 3. I was on my way to Revision 3 yesterday, and then I saw it on dry dock. And I was like, I don't know. I don't, hopefully we get Leo back. I mean, if it gets stalled down in South America, we might. It could be a long time. I don't want to worry worry anybody here at the Twit Studios, but it's kind of kind of scary. Anyway, uh, we have a great uh, great cast here uh, uh, from uh, from Indianapolis. Justin Williams from Second Gear. Hey, Justin. Hello. How are you doing there? Uh, just want to say that if my internet connection drops at any time, assume the ice has won. <laughs> how is it there? It, the, I went outside thinking that I would pick up lunch today, and there is just a giant sheet of ice. There is nothing. There, anyone that is out today is insane because there's more ice coming down as I'm looking out the window. It's, it's crazy. Please never come here. Well, it makes you. Uh, it makes you. If it makes you feel any better, it's really sunny and nice here in Petaluma. You know, just yeah. You keep wearing that short sleeve shirt there, Mr. Lindsay. Yeah, you know, you can see it right here. It's uh, you know, it's yeah. You know, and and I was a little warm on the way on the way here sorry so uh, also sorry. coming in from all uh we don't know what the weather's like in in atlanta a aaron hillegas from big nerd ranch hey aaron it's a little cool and rainy today but it's a lot more pleasant than uh in a lot of places <laughs> rainy for it cool and rainy for atlanta which what, what temperature atlanta. does cool what is cool in atlanta it's probably 60 degrees here yeah yeah so, so there, so there yeah you rub it in <laughs> So we've got a lot of great news uh, for today. So we're, we're really uh, cranking through here. We'll jump right into it. Uh, Sony, okay, here's, the, here's some, some big news, and it, it has some possible, possibly some very big impl implications. So the Sony Reader app is now, has now been, uh, has been rejected, and basically Apple's saying you can't do in-app uh, purchases without going through the system that they've created. Uh, it, of course, none of us really are using the Sony, Sony Reader. Not very many of us are using the Sony Reader right now, and that's that's not a big deal. But the thing that it, this, of course, brings up immediately is how does this affect uh, the Kindle? Aaron, is this is this something that we might see across the system, and and could this actually affect what Amazon's doing? Well, I think it's a it's a real big concern. I mean, naturally, Apple is trying to leverage what they have in the iTunes Store and iBooks to really dominate the uh, the whole area. And this is a this is a way they could really damage the Kindle experience. I mean, when you're thinking about buying a book and you think, well, I could buy it on iBooks, and then it would only be available on my Apple platforms, or I could buy it on the Kindle, then I could it would be available everywhere. It's a very compelling story, and it does not play well with Apple's narrative. Justin, does this does this worry you uh, as an as an app developer? Um, yeah, as an app developer, it does worry me. But I don't. Has Apple actually come out and said what their intentions are with this? Because it seems like this would be something that would really frustrate both 
consumers, me definitely because I'm a Kindle user, but also publishers because they're kind of saying, all right, if you want to have any sort of book content or magazine content or any digital content on an iPhone or an iPad, you've got to go through us. And then you say this to all the people who have a Nook or have a Kindle and you say, all right, you guys want to use that stuff on your iPad now? Well, you need to rebuy those books through the iPad. What is Apple saying? Well, it, it, it basically, one, one of the things it looks like in TechCrunch, uh, it looks like has uh, some more of the, uh, uh, some more of the details, but the, it looks like Apple saying it's not for everything. It's not going to change the way the Kindle set up. It's not changing anything that there, anybody else has had, had put together, but it's specifically the way Sony is actually putting this together is the problem that they're, that they're having. So, um, so anyway, so it, it, we'll, we'll see how this how this pans out. But of course, this is something that everyone worries about when they think about Apple, uh, you know, and they think of the Mac App Store. This is, you know, and the and and the and the closed system that Apple's creating is that Apple really is the they, they're the owner of all of this. They there's not a lot of, uh, you know, they can do right, currently they can pretty much do whatever they want to do. Um, it doesn't look like I think that. I think we can all agree that Apple probably couldn't go down the path of turning Kindle off. Um, I, you know, it seems like that would be um, pretty painful. Even people like me, who who are pretty strong Apple supporters, would be pretty upset because I, I still buy most of my books on the Kindle because I don't. Uh, most of the books that I want to buy are not on the on the iBookstore. So the uh, so, go ahead, go ahead, Justin. Well, what I'm what I'm thinking is that. They haven't really, they're not saying what it is, but my my theory right now is that they're basically saying that if you want to be able to do purchase it or to use content that you buy outside of the app store, you have to be able to offer it as an in-app purchase in store. And so what, my interpretation of that would be that if you want to buy a Kindle book on Amazon site, you have to also have to be able to buy it through the Kindle or through in-app purchases on your iPhone, which then would give Apple the 30% cut. So what will happen maybe we'll see when the next version of the kindle app that comes out it's not going to have the buy books button up in the upper left corner or wherever that button is they'll just take that button out and say if you want to get books you just have to assume that you're going to go to amazon site or to the barnes and noble site and this, or this could have something to do with the daily and this is according to uh, Apple's spokesman uh, has given this statement specifically. This is on TechCrunch. We have not changed our developer terms or guidelines. We are now requiring that if an app offers customers the ability to purchase books outside of the app, that the same option is also available to customers from within the app uh, with in-app purchase. So that's the, the, the it's the, it is the you have to do both. It appears um, to stay in the uh, to stay within Apple's bounds. I think that what they don't want to do is send people out. Right now, I guess there's no way to do this with the app, with the amp, with Kindle. I don't think. I don't know if you can buy. Can you buy books? Uh, I've never tried to buy a book. In the what it app. does is it launches a web view. So you click a button and it say and it launches mobile Safari. You go to the Amazon mobile site, you buy the book and you say, send it to my iPad, send it to my Kindle, send it to whatever device you want to use. And then when you relaunch the app, it downloads it. So there's no in-app purchase in its essence. It's basically do doing what any other, what they've been doing for three years. It's basically just pushing you off to a mobile web browser. So, so but, but the question you, is, is Apple going to continue to allow this? And if Apple doesn't, if, if Apple says, yeah, you can keep the, the Kindle on, here, but you're going to have to start going making in-app purchase available. Is Amazon going to say, you know what, we're going to we're going to pull out? Right. That's how you have to. You're kind of having trouble parsing the semantics of what Apple's statement is. There are they saying you have if you're going to have any sort of digital content, even if you were to buy it on your Mac or your PC at home, you have to offer it for sale in the app in the app via in-app purchase. Or are they saying that if you're going to sell stuff by opening mobile Safari on the phone, you have to offer an app? The first one, that's probably not a good thing. The second one, I can tolerate although it is a frustrating thing both as a developer and an iphone user because i do i use kindle far more often than i use the ibooks app now aaron do you think that do you think that amazon would go by and if amazon pulled it do you think that the pr becomes an issue for amazon as opposed to apple apple just saying well these are the rules and you have to add this to it and then that leaves it to amazon to pull the app out of the out of the system oh we've lost his lost his audio oh, hold on a second uh, we lost your audio, Aaron. If you can hear us, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yes. So we just recently wrote a, an ebook reader for a client who, who sells books, and I know that they would be very reluctant it, to make that option available because Apple would take their 30% from the uh, in-app sales. 
So I would think that Amazon would be in a similar situation. They have, uh, they've discounted it. I don't think they're going to feel comfortable with selling books at the same price through the Apple store. So we'll see, we'll see how this, uh, this pans out. Uh, we're going we're gonna to keep track of this. I mean, hopefully we'll know one way or the other from Amazon in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked a lot about at, the, uh, at, at Macworld, and we'll talk a little bit more about Macworld as we, as we move forward, is, um, is really the Mac App Store and the future of, of iOS and OS X. Uh, and one of the things I think we have the advantage of today is that we've got some developers that are, that are here uh, online. And it'd be very interesting to hear uh, what you guys think about the first uh, month, month and a half of the Mac App Store and what you think it may um, hint to uh, in the future. Uh, Aaron, what do, you, what do you think as far as uh, what you've seen uh, to date uh, with the Mac App Store? How do you think it's, how do you think it's performing? Oh, I think it's going great. Uh, I think it, it, developers are seeing revenues they never would have seen otherwise. I think Justin's probably the right person to answer the question, but everyone seems really excited. The, uh, the app itself is a little awkward. I find searching things not great, but I think that'll evolve over time. Justin, what, what do you think? Um, I really, really like the Mac App Store, both as a consumer as, and as a developer. So if you approach it from the developer standpoint, it's really great because my main Mac application is called Today, and it's basically a daily calendar that you can use in conjunction with iCal. And it's an, it's an app that a lot of people are really a big fan of that use it, but it's not actually something that you would ever search for, like you would say cooking software or software to manage your book catalogs. And the Mac App Store is giving apps that have this really unique and useful utility, productivity apps like that, that you might not necessarily search for. It's giving users a really great way to just casually browse and find these like gems out there, these pick, things that you would put as a pick of the week on Mac Break or you would write about as a Mac gem on Mac World. It's making it a lot easier to find those and get more people to use the app. So I'm really a fan of it because it makes my apps a lot more accessible to users. And then just whenever I want to buy stuff now, I've, I've started to become the lazy snob who doesn't want to buy software outside of the Mac App Store. You know, it's, it, only it's, been one of the things, it's one of the things we've been we talking about. <laughs> so we were talking about this uh, at, uh, at Macworld. Uh, I found myself very, very quickly uh, moving to, for small applications, large applications, I can understand not having them on the App Store. I can understand going through an install process. But for anything less than, you know, $100 or even $200, I'm, I find myself now just going, why isn't this on the on the Mac App Store? I mean, why do I have to go through all this process to, to download it and install it? It, it, it seems that uh, very quickly, this is, and this is what, of course, everyone's worried about, is that, um, is that, it's going to become the de facto way, especially if you're doing a, a small application or a smaller application, uh, that this is the way people are going to want to buy it. Now, the question is, is that, Aaron, do you think that this drives uh, developers towards uh, building more small applications and less large, complex ones? I think it really does. I mean, when we're seeing the pricing power and the idea of uh, apps are going to be expected to be at a lower and lower price point, I think people are going to be forced to do quicker release cycles, add a few features, get what you can out of it, and move forward. Um, I think that overall the iPhone app store has changed expectations of users. That they're starting to think they should be able to buy a program for $1.99. And I'll be interested to see if we can adjust those expectations over time. Well, yeah, and, and I know that for me, I, I have gotten into this situation where, uh, like, when I see an iApp that has that does more than one thing, it does, it, you know, it's it's actually, uh, uh, you know, it's got a whole bunch of things. It's a Swiss Army knife. I'm like, whoa, 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 that's not what I want to buy for my iPhone. You know, that's not what I buy. I want to buy one th something that does one thing. You know, and if it does, if they start adding more features, I immediately uh, start to, um, you know not sure if they're all going to really work or I don't want, I definitely don't want to pay for them. I kind of want to buy each piece. Justin, does this affect how you, um, you know, approach development? Uh, yeah, it does, but I don't think it's going to affect pricing the way that it has affected it on the iOS app store. I, what I think is going to happen is that you're going to see a different class of applications. So you're still going to have the large applications like the rapid weavers or the photoshops or the, uh, well, I'm trying to look at my doc here, the iChats, the larger applications that have a general utility, and those are still going to be your $35, your $40 Mac applications, but you're going to see a lot of smaller utility apps that are kind of like the one trick ponies that you get on the iPhone. And I think those are going to be around the five or $10 range. In my case with today, what I did is I'm still going to maintain having both of my stores. So I'll have the store that I'm using on my website and then I'll be in the Mac app store. But 
for the launch, I decided to experiment with the pricing a little bit. And by default today retails for $25, which is what I've been charging basically because it doesn't sell as many copies because not as many people are looking for it. But I was like, well, we've got this captive audience with the Mac app store now. So let's put it out there at 10 bucks and people can still go to my website. They can try it. And if they like it, 10 bucks, the sales have been higher than they were in the past 11 months. It hasn't been this high since it la I launched today too, back in January of 2010. And I think part of that is because it's finding an audience. And part of that is because now it's priced at a point where people think it's still a great utility, but it's still not $1.99. $10 is still not something that you have to think about. And I think you're going to see a lot of other applications play with that as well. The uh, the real Mac software guys have done that as well. They have an application called Little Snapper, which is a really great utility if you're going to be archiving screenshots. I use it all the time to kind of look for inspiration on whenever I find a screenshot of something in a new app, I take a screenshot of it. But that's an app that's gone from, I think, $40 to $30 to $20. And a couple of weeks ago, they just went ahead and did a $5 weekend price advance, a pricing sale, and they sold more copies than they had ever, I think. Well, and, and, and that, but doesn't that start creating a slippery slope? Before we get, before we go any further, I want to introduce uh, Andy Anako, who uh, we, we, we had a little trouble with uh, connectivity, but, um, but we now have him uh, here. And, and right now, Andy's a little stretched here, but he's, you can see him here. We're going we're gonna to drop him in. Andy, uh, how is the weather in, uh, in uh, Boston? Uh, it's white, Alex. It's very, very white. Uh, the, the, you can mark you, I, I made a notation in my diary that around 1031 this morning is the exact point uh, into, in uh, the 2010-2011 uh, season in which I decided that snow is no longer New England picturesque. It's just a big pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is, is yes. Yeah. So so yes. Look, judging behind me, you know what 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 the weather is like right now. It's actually started again this morning. So <laughs> now when, now when did you get back from MacWorld? I got back uh, early on Sunday. I took the red eyes uh, overnight Saturday. Right. So I just got into one one of those rare keyholes between blizzards. Now we we were. This is the conversation that that I left you with. Actually, we, we were having this conversation uh, at MacWorld about the future of the Mac App Store. Uh, as well as the future of, of iOS and, and OS 10, the the uh, the question really is is that is are we going is is the price going to erode? You know, overall, I mean, can you maintain a three hundred dollar application or a four hundred dollar application as the as this Mac App Store continues to expand, Andy? I just think that the three hundred dollar and the four hundred dollar applications never needed the App Store to begin with. So I don't think that they're 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 going to have to continue to justify their prices. Uh, Photoshop always had to justify why someone ha would have to spend six hundred dollars on an app that lets you just you know remove wrinkles, creases, and uh, and 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 restore one's shapely figure. But uh, for the, the I think the the real meat of the Mac app environment has always been the cheaper ones, the ones that are like fifty bucks and less. Uh, I did I have been doing sort of a casual sort of tour of what the prices are doing on the Mac App Store. And I haven't seen a really big softening of prices yet. What I haven't seen is like what we've, what I've been hearing for the past five minutes in which there are a lot of developers who are sort of experimenting with, uh, gee, my goodness, I had no idea I'd be selling so many copies of this piece of software over the past few weeks. What would happen if I were to reduce prices just this weekend and let's see if I can, if, if I were to just uh, cut the price down to five bucks from 20 just for three days, what would that happen? So I think that if there's a softening of prices, it's going to be experimental in nature, uh, and it's going to end right quick as soon as developers realize that uh, they've started to price themselves out of the market. Yeah, it's, it's hey, Alex, what you're dealing good. with. Oops. Go ahead, <laughs> Alex. I have one more interesting data point, mm -hmm. which is that uh, you know we offer classes on Cocoa Desktop programming and iOS programming, and we're seeing a lot more demand for the Cocoa programming right now. So three months ago, it was hard to sell. Now it's easy to sell. So there are new developers coming into the environment just because of the Mac store, I believe. Well, I, you know, just because of the Mac store for me, I know that, you know, we do mostly pro apps. And one of the things that we're really looking at is taking the green screen technologies and so on and so forth that we, that we make in DV Garage uh, and finding ways to package them into $10 or $20 items because it's something that we think that there's a, there's a big market out there that, that we're, we haven't really been accessing. And, and, I, and it's interesting because it's been going the other direction for us most of the time. We've been slowly increasing our prices because no one takes us seriously. So it's the same, the same thing. You know, we, 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 we went, we had a $99 application. Um, and when we made it one ninety nine, we sold 
twice as many. You know, and, I, and, and it was just like this, I, I don't understand. You know, and, and so um, so in, in our world, in the professional world, you have this <laughs> issue where people look at it and it's kind of like the price of wine. Well, that can't be a good price of wine. That can't be good wine because it's $9.99. Um, I, I, I think you sort of hit upon the difference between uh, between two different classes of apps. There's a difference between the price you need to set when someone is spending their own money and the price you need to set when they're spending their client's money. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's it's going to be interesting. We're going to come right back and discuss this a little bit more uh, and talk about uh, how this this new Mac App Store fits into the greater picture of iOS and OS X. Uh, but before we do that, I want to thank one of our sponsors, uh, Gazelle. Uh, of course, um, I, I just I'm piling up. I got a box in my house that is uh, it's got I just I, it, it's got a big Sharpie thing on the side that just says um, Gazelle. You know, and, and, and it's just like, you know, I'm no longer saying I'm throwing it away. Like, I'm, oh, I'm getting rid of that. I'm saying, uh, yeah, I'm going to, um, I, I just, I, I got to gazelle it, you know, and it's no longer, it's no longer getting rid of it. It's gazelling it. And uh, the, you know, if you have smartphones, MP3 players, ebook readers, laptops, cameras, all of those things, you know, there are 200,000 items that you can get, um, that you can sell on gazelle. And, and it's really easy. Here's, here's how it works. You go to gazelle.com. And uh, you can enter your make and model of your gadget. You can see how Gazelle is going to, you know, what, what it's going to offer. And, you know, and you have to go through in there and say, well, it's in good, pristine condition. Um, I have the box for it, which I never, I never have. I'm, I don't really like boxes. Um, you know, do I have all the, all the cables, which I, I never have either. So, you know, now, now, now that I'm going through it, the other thing I'm using Gazelle for, by the way, is a guide to what I have to do so that I can sell this, these items later because I never thought about those things before. I never try to keep track of them. Um, but you can go in into Marketplace and, and, and you can see this little graph that's going to tell you exactly, you know, where, you know, this is how bad it's going to get if you hang on to that item. So, you know, there's a little bit of pressure. A little bit of pressure to, uh, to, to kind of move, move along and, uh, and, and sell your item, get rid of it. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, before Gazelle, I have to admit that I was just kind of, um, there's a, there was a box and it was just literally where electronics went. And then they would sit there for another six months or a year. And then I would finally just kind of try to figure out where to, where to put them. You know, and, and, and the other thing is, is, if your item isn't worth anything anymore, Gazelle will responsibly uh, recycle it, which is, a, which is an important piece because a lot of times we don't know where to put it. And just throwing it away is... Um, Really, really bad karma, just in case you're wondering. So um, now you can, here's the, the key is go to gazelle.com, use the offer code MACBREAK, and you're going to get 5% more. So it's not just, uh, you know, you can, um, depending on what you're going to get, whether your iPhone is, if it's $300, you're going to get three fifteen. dollars So definitely check it out. Gazelle.com, it is the best way uh, to get rid of the stuff that you're not using anymore, all the electronic items that you're stacking up. And uh, as Mac users who buy everything that Steve, um, you know, tells us to buy. Uh, this is this is a great thing for us. Uh, you know, you're able to avoid the the uh, the landfill, uh, avoid avoid all those other things, and and get it out there. So don't just throw don't throw it away. Don't sell it. Gazelle it. Gazelle.com. And once again, use the Mac Break code to get five percent more. Uh, so now we've got the we have uh, the you know the Mac App Store. We've got the iOS Store. And one of the things that you know that Andy and I don't don't necessarily see eye to eye on. We, we've had this discussion a couple of times that is, I think that, I think that OS 10, the way the OS 10, as we know it is over, I think it's gone. <laughs> I think that, you know, I mean, I think that well, it, it's, okay, it's, okay. it's, it's dead, dead OS walking. Well, let, let's, let's put this in the right framework. Uh, most of the times these arguments go down to is the Mac, is the desktop OS moving towards iOS, which is a totally different question. I agree that the Mac OS 10 is dead. It's so uh, ex parrot. It's drawing the court and run the right. Well, on the way, it's not dead, but it can see dead from here. It's on a on a dead plan, a very good uh, dead go pilot live uh, sort of course track. But that's just the natural way of things. Now, how how long did we really have uh, a Mac OS nine, Mac OS System seven, Mac OS eight, Mac OS nine before it got replaced and transitioned into something that was a lot bigger and a lot better? But I don't think that we're going to see a sort of a uh, we're, we're not going to see a sort of bastard child between iOS and Mac OS into the next edition of the desktop operating system. I just think that Apple's going to just like, I mean, just like they said during the uh, the press event a few months ago, I think that they're going to uh, they're going to listen and observe of what works well for iOS. I think that they were just as surprised as a lot of observers when they realized that a lot of people were buying uh, were buying iPads uh, with keyboards, with with kick with uh, with easel stands because they're actually using them not just as tablet, or just you know screen tablet for readers and just little quick emails and quick editing, but they're traveling with them as regular notebook computers. So I think that that's they're going to learn that. 
a certain concepts that they thought were sacrosanct for the desktop. You know, this is this works for mobile. This works for desktop. They're going to realize that. Well, you know what? Maybe a one window focused, no distractions interface is a good thing to support on the OS level. Something now, like that. So, but the the thing, the, the question is really. I mean, iOS of course is locked down. It's a, it's a controlled environment. It's a safe environment. Uh, you know, and and the question is, and there's a lot of us that are geeks. We grew up with our Mac. I mean, I grew up with an Apple II before I had a Mac, and and we're just used to the fact that we get to get underneath. We get to make all these changes. We get to adjust our system the way we want. But w but when we look at our our kids, our parents, and a lot of our friends that are in the coffee shop, a lot of them are checking email, surfing the web, and they don't really want to know how to run those installs. They don't, don't really want to know how to do those things. On the other side, you've got developers who don't really want to deal with DRM if they don't if they don't have to. If, you know, if that was all built into the hardware. Uh, Aaron, does, is this something that is just inevitable that we're going to see more and more of the iOS until there's really not an OS 10 the way we know it left? So your question was kind of backwards to me. That was, you said, <laughs> is OS 10 going to become iOS? And really what we're seeing is iOS becomes more and more like Mac OS 10 with every revision, right? They came yes, out with two printing. Yes, 2.1, Alex. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, and menus and all sorts of things are being added to iOS that are largely a desktop experience. So when the iPad came out, people started saying, well, I want to have a lot of my capabilities from the Mac here on the iPad. And if there's some sort of merger happening, it's happening in that way. As gradually as the devices can handle it, more and more of Mac OS X is being added into iOS. Now, technically, there are some things that are very elegant about iOS because they got a chance to back up and sort of rethink it. Um, the way the views and the layers work together is, is much more elegant from a programmer point of view. But um, I'll, see, I'll be interested to see if those things gradually become integrated in with Mac OS X. Just Note also okay. that the simulator that developers use on the Mac indicates that everything that currently works on iOS is already compiled to run on OS X. Interesting. Yeah. So, it, it, well, and I think the thing we we oftentimes forget is that is that you uh, the, this, they're both sitting on the same platform. I mean, we're really just yep. talking about the last ten percent of the OS of exactly how it, it interfaces with you. Uh, the rest of it's all the same. Or, or, exactly or, right. Yeah. And, and so uh, now, Justin, do you see a closed system coming? Do you think that Apple will close the system down like it's closed down with iOS eventually, five years from now? Um, I waffle on this a lot. I Some days I think, yes, that's what we're going to have. Other days I think, no. If you ask me where I, what I'm going to be using 10 years from now to be building software, I can't see myself using an iPad running Xcode. I think we're still going to have not necessarily Mac OS X, but we're going to have maybe some sort of more powerful desktop operating system, and we're still going to have a Mac. It might be running iOS as the core, but I don't think that we're ever going to get to a point where we don't need keyboards and mice for complex tasks. I, can, you, can you envision doing all sorts of complex video editing and After Effects sort of things using just your finger, Alex? You know, I, I, I'd i say no until I started playing with some of the iMovie stuff on my iPhone and, and started going, well, you know, it's not, I couldn't do it now. Uh, and, and, I, and I do agree that I don't think that it, I don't think we're, I think that there's something in the middle. There's something where I have, you know, I, I can have those external controls. Uh, and to be honest with you, I'm not saying this like I'm excited because this terrifies me as a as a pro user um that that i would have that stuff taken away because it is um you know the other thing the other things that scare me are the i you know comments like the truck the trucks are dead you know you know that, that apple isn't going to you know we saw the the server go away um uh, you know this week um and uh we we see a lot of the the, the, the pro things and I, I look at my mac pro just hoping that i keep on getting those because um they're they're already the mac pro itself is too limited for me i mean i need eight slots it has five slots i don't want to you know, I don't want everything to go to an iMac, um, but but as you start to see the the you know the just blistering success of of the i, I iPhone and iPad, and you look at the money, I mean, it is you know Apple is making thirty percent on every app. Isn't this isn't this what Steve always wanted? You know, is to is, well, is you have this. It's, it's an incredibly good business model. You have to admit. Oh yeah, Steve loves this. He thinks this is the greatest thing ever. But I don't think that we're going to be able. I don't think you can tell Mac users by and large, that they're no longer going to be able to do the things they've done for 20 plus years, and they're just going to have to accept, all right, if you want to be on the Apple bandwagon going forward, you've got to use this iPad, and you have to sit there and maybe type with a keyboard that you've connected via Bluetooth or one of those docks, but you have to point your finger at the screen all day long. I just can't see people wanting to do that. I try, A couple of weeks ago, I was building a PowerPoint or a Keynote presentation, and I tried to use Keynote on my iPad, and it's, it's totally usable, but 
Compared to the convenience and speed of using a mouse and keyboard, it took hours to get this done. Well, and, and I have something to admit, that could have I, taken an hour to do it on my Mac. Yeah, I don't develop anything like any any of the iApp stuff. I have to admit, I don't develop uh, whether it's Keynote or or Numbers or Pages. I haven't I haven't found that I'm developing anything on the on there. I this is where I edit things, but they have to be kind of started uh, before that. Andy. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I I disagree with Keynote. I, as a matter of fact, there's so many times when I'm just trying to conceptually walk my way through a presentation. There's so many times when I will actually build it in Keynote for the iPad because it's one of those very rare instances of a completely genetic level iPad interface uh, for, uh, for for a familiar application. One of the reasons why I think we haven't seen anything, any sort of word processor to compete with pages is because everybody's just taking, well, here's our cut down mobile word processor that we originally developed for the Palm Pilot 10 years ago, and we've just simply ported it over and are projecting it inside, uh, inside a, uh, an iPad view. Uh, I think that we're going to have to see developers that can really grok the iPad, just really figure out what makes it different and what, how, how people are going to interact with user interface elements and the things that they're building, uh, because it's, it's just, it's, 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 it's hard to articulate. It's, it's, it's the idea that uh, we're not looking for the re one of the great things about a keyboard and mouse interface is that it's a common point of reference for everybody. We've all been using these things for sometimes, sometimes going on two decades. And so if a developer comes with the point of view that whatever interface I build is going to involve moving this around and clicking this button and doing a lot of this on this standard row of buttons, that's, that sort of eliminates 50% of the bizarreness you could do when a developer is simply presented with, here is just an empty field of absolutely anything you can put into it. And you can put a lot of dopey things in when you don't have physical keys to work with. That's going to be the problem. Well, and, and I, know that, I know that in many ways this is a, a, an issue of and we've talked about this before, but the the idea when when we started film, film was uh, let's take some camera, let's take some big film cameras a uh, hundred hundred years ago and take pictures of stage plays, you know, like like and that's and yeah. that's where it started. And you know, by the end of the century, we were making the Matrix and Bullet Time, and we were doing a whole lot of other things that you could never even conceived of a hundred years before when they were just like popping it up. And film was not, you know, it was taking something that we knew, which was stage plays, and then making it and then adding a new medium to it. In the same way, you know, I find that I'm now in this situation where I'm halfway in between uh, magazines. Like, I don't want to buy any more paper magazines. Done. You know, I just don't want to buy buy these. But when I open up the magazines on my iPad, I'm not that happy with them. You know, I don't want to, you know, I don't, like, I don't want to, yeah. the, the, the magazine format on the, uh, on the iPad or iPhone isn't sufficient for me to want to use it there. And so now I find myself actually reading less. Um, you know, so, so I, you know, you know, it's, it's just this odd, this odd situation where it's, it's this in between. Now, one of the things that we're going to find out a little bit more about related to magazines, of course, is the, uh, the daily, which is, uh, I guess going to be announced. It looks like tomorrow we're, uh, Andy, have you been invited? Uh, I have not been invited. No, I still, I, 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 not, I, I, not that you're bitter. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's Rupert Murdoch. You know, I understand that I want to step on any toes by, you know, telling Rupert, Rupert though, by the way, Andy Notko, the one who is not afraid to speak truth to power is going to be the audience. So I understand. It's <laughs> <laughs> do we, what, do, what do we expect, Aaron, what do you expect to see with the, what do you think is going to be different about the Daily? Well, it's an interesting uh, question about what does a magazine look like when you begin with the idea that it's going to be on the iPad, that it's going to be dynamic. I would imagine it'll be much more social process behind every article. So that's been sort of done. I imagine it'll be very pretty uh, and focus on more media. So video and images. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm interested to see what, it, what the announcement looks like. I mean, to me, the, the perfect app at the moment for browsing information is Flipboard. I mean, I, you know, and the only thing that drives me crazy about Flipboard is that it takes me out to the web app. You know, like I don't want to go to their web pages. I just want to watch. I mean, of course, I understand why that has to happen from a business perspective. But from a user's perspective, it makes me a little crazy. Justin, are, the are biggest you, problem. Yeah, go ahead. The biggest problem you've got with the magazine apps right now is I'm like you. I don't want to buy paper magazines anymore. I, the the happiest day I will have is when I can stop getting a paper subscription to Sports Illustrated or to other magazines I subscribe to and get them on my iPad. But the versions that are out there right now, beyond just having to pay five bucks per issue, they're designed as if you're trying to translate paper onto the iPad. And that's just, that doesn't work. It's a terrible experience. Right. Now, do you, do you see that changing tomorrow? I mean, do you think that we're going to see a new subscription plan as well as uh, a new approach to the design? 
Yeah, I think we're going to see a new subscription plan, which is going to be a nice thing. I don't know if it's going to be enough to appease the Condé Nast and Time Warners of the world who are frustrated that they're not getting subscriber data from Apple. But I think we're going to see that. My biggest concern with the daily, just by reading the rumors out there, is that it's just going to be updated daily. We're in the internet age. We don't we get we go to the New York Times 15 times a day and see constantly updated material. Why would I want to subscribe to something that I'm just going to have updated once and then have to wait till the next day for the latest batch of news and opinion pieces? Um, and, but the, but then what what do you want to do? Do you want to have a metered system where you're downloaded you're, you're charged for per meg, per megabyte or per unit of information downloaded? Well, not necessarily. I don't, I, don't that, mean this, I don't mean this sarcastically. I think I think that one of the biggest problems of this is just simply going to be how do you keep it fresh on an hourly basis, but still simply say that yes, we're going to charge you in a we're going to charge you a fee that's relative to the content that you consume. Right, and that that's a hard problem. But my my guess or what I would like is to say, all right, I would like to subscribe to this for let's say ten bucks a month or whatever the charge they want to charge, and that gets me access to the content. And this is this is also something that I I'm curious to see if they're going to pass this down to developers like me and Aaron. Are we going to be able to say with our applications that we're not necessarily content apps, but you can subscribe to a year's worth of updates to Elements or a year's worth of updates to Angry Birds for a dollar or five dollars or whatever it is? Is this going to be something that's just limited to magazine content or newspaper content, or is this something that's going to be translated down to app developers as well? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see. I, I think that the I, I, I'm going to guess that Apple is going to build something that's very specific to uh, magazine and content developers, at least at first, to uh, you know to try to to try to work through that that process. Because I think that, and I and I know that for me, I am oftentimes very, uh, um, uh, you know, I have different expectations of different kinds of news. So when I go up to the front of CNN, or or you know, or if I go to if I'm seeing stuff going past on Twitter. Or Huffington Post, I'm you know expecting something to be churning and changing and so on and so forth. When I read the Economist, I expect that to be happening once a week, and 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 I know that they're gonna they're gonna be they're gonna have thought about it a little bit longer <laughs> when they when the Economist comes out than than uh, what they posted as far as this is just happening. Uh, we're gonna create a little context. Uh, same with like if I'm reading Foreign Affairs, you know it's gonna be a lot. You know someone probably spent a couple months working on that, and it doesn't have to necessarily anything to do with what's happening today. So I think that we look right. at, we have different expectations of our content as far as, uh, you know, what's coming through. And I think yeah. daily is just one piece of that. Andy? Yeah, I mean, there's there's the Joshua algorithm from War Games. Sometimes the only way to win is not to play. Uh, if the, I, I think the, the first big successful commercial model for this kind of publishing is going to be to say, look, we've got thousands <laughs> of people every single day rushing to be the first publication out five minutes after something's happened with some information about it. Let's leave that business to those people. Let's be the folks who a day later will give you a complete uh, story about what's going on. Not only that, but how many times have you been on the, on the, on the internet and you saw a piece about a piece of history or an event from five years ago with new, that, that's a historical record, a historical document. That's just so interesting that you wound up having to instapaper it because there's no way in hell you're going to finish this over your bowl of Cheerios before you get to get to work. So I think those are the models that, uh, those are the sort of, that's the sort of journalism that, that, uh, commercial publications like these can do extremely well. Now, Aaron, did you, do you think this is going to lead to an explosion of a whole new set of, of apps that are really designed for content that aren't necessarily a, a just to push the magazine to, I mean, because right now, like one of the big things at Macworld was, was uh, how to move InDesign, how to move the design that you already have into, mm -hmm. into your iPad. Uh, do you think that the daily is going to put a lot of pressure on just rethinking and recoding, uh, you know, how people get content to the, to the eye, eye devices? I don't think it's a new problem. So if you look at a company like Vimeo, they've been working on it for years now. The exact same idea of taking what's in a magazine and getting it into a pleasant, readable form on the iPad. Is it going to put a little more fire under them? Sure. Every time that someone comes out with a great app, it raises the bar a little bit, and that's great for the whole industry. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, so... One of the things I wanted to ask you guys, now, who, who made it? No, so I guess Andy and I were the only ones at Macworld. Andy, were we, did you, Justin? Did, I'm sorry, not Justin. No, I didn't make it this year. You didn't, you didn't make it. Um, no, so it's Macworld a miracle still going on? Get out of Oh, ow. Oh, snack. <laughs> oh, no, he did not. <laughs> oh, I did. <laughs> do, do, the, do, the, yes. do the Tyra Banks no, head bubble. I, I haven't been too. to Macworld in years. What happened? Why not? This is a good question, actually. Why haven't you come to Macworld in the last couple of years? Uh, I guess that uh, when Apple started stopped showing up, that it sort of invalidated 
the nature of the entire conference. Um, I think it's a great wow, chance for a, those, them. They're, them, they're fighting words. We should have gotten Paul Ken on on here with you and uh, <laughs> have a little chat. But I mean, the point is that so much news and information about products is ex is available on the internet. Um, in some ways, a big consumer conference just doesn't make sense. I don't know if CES makes sense anymore. You know, I think that it's one of the things that I find interesting is as someone in the press, it's very important to me. So the thing is, is that, you know, and I think that this is the only thing that, that happens. I think that there's a social aspect of, of the, uh, of being there and seeing lots of people that, that I think is really interesting. I think that be, as someone on the press, being able to touch items and, and play with them and, 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 uh, and see how they work. There's a lot of things I saw there that I haven't seen anywhere else. Um, you know, that I haven't, really gotten to play with enough to know that, oh, this is something I actually want to use. And as I said, as someone in the press, we're walking around, there's a lot of us, walking around with cameras, walking around with video cameras. And so for a, for a uh, you know, developer uh, who's putting that together, we had a couple people, like I had a booth there and, um, you know, showing off our little green screen. And, uh, and we had a bunch of people from the press come by and we know that, you know, they would not have understood before when we were trying to explain to them what we do. Oh yeah, we do live stereo 3d green screen uh you know compositing um on your on your mac uh it's kind of like you know it's round for kids you know you know it's, it's, it's hard to describe to the to these guys like why you would need that or why it would be interesting uh and uh and as soon as they saw it though they were like okay we need to talk about this or they're taking pictures and they're taking video and i think that's the, that's the hard thing i think that um the other thing that i noticed uh from this and, and we almost had it working so for those of you listening um we tried to uh, uh, we tried to do this crazy thing where we had Aaron and Andy and I and Adam Christensen and and, and Aaron was in in uh, in Atlanta um, and the rest of us were in the room and then we were streaming it to a to an, a virtual audience and I couldn't quite get the audio working with Aaron so we and we didn't have Aaron in there but it was what I felt like is we were touching on something that made sense from a co conference perspective of having the conference be a hub for a, a virtual community. So out, we were answering questions, not only from the audience, the 100, 150 people that were in the audience, but from, from the three or 400 people that were watching online. And there was something about that that, that, that I thought we were touching on something that, that, that made sense for a conference. Um, uh, but, but, you know, it's not, didn't have it quite finished. Andy, do you think that this well, is going to continue to, I mean, do you think, what, what do you think the future is of Macworld? Well, I think you kind of touched on exactly the the, the secret to it. Uh, there's always been, uh, even when the even when the, the Macworld Expo was the the, the 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 fulcrum of the entire Macintosh year with Steve Jobs keynotes a go go. This has always been. There's always been the front of the house and the back of the house sort of a show, where there's there's this there's the stuff that anybody can come in and see. There's the expo hall. There's the uh, there's the exhibitors. There's the classes and there's the keynotes. But there's always been. All that part of the show that gets sustained just by the fact that so many people from so many categories are in the same location at the same time. Uh, I'll have so many meetings, many of which are not terribly related to what's happening that week uh, in hotel suites and restaurants and the, the tea house uh, near my, in the Yerba Buena Gardens. And I think that that's going to be one of the reasons why the why Mac World Expo will always be relevant. And that's even uh, before you start talking about what's happening on the show floor. But I think that you have a really good idea. So long as Mac World Expo remains the idea that this is one week in which the focus, the entire Mac community, the entire Apple user community can have one thing to focus on, that there's always going to be something interesting and relevant happening on that floor. It will definitely continue to have a reason to exist. And if part of the reason, one of the ways to do that is to make sure that so many of these sessions are going to be live streamed, not just simply recorded and then played back later on YouTube, but live streamed with the opportunity for actual interaction, then we're going to have people who are might decide that, you know, I, I was going to have this big meeting scheduled for two o'clock. Uh, you know, pe people from a thousand miles away or halfway across the world. I was going to have this big meeting at two o'clock, but I made sure I scheduled it for three 30 because Alex Lindsay is going to be talking about this subject at two o'clock. And I really wanted to watch the live stream and maybe ask him a couple of questions. So it's so long as, so long as uh, we make the, the, the best way to do this in a post Steve jobs, uh, keynote world is to make sure that it is that locus that central, so that center of attention for four or five days. Yeah, I, you know, I uh, it's one of the things I'm always excited about going to these, uh, going to MacWorld and going to you know CES, and it mostly is that being able to see everybody that I don't get to see. That's the only time yep. I get to see them, and and I think that there, it is it is easy to think that we can get all the information online, but it it really isn't the same as being face to face and and uh, eating good. 
Um, Ethiopian food. As, uh, <laughs> I took, I took Andy and I went for uh, some Ethiopian. Um, it's, it's always fun to eat with sticks. It's even, it's just as fun to eat with your hands. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, uh, um, but I think that, that getting everybody in town, I think has always been one of those things. And, but I think that finding ways to embrace that, that, uh, virtual world as well. And, and having these, these conferences become more like one of the things that we want to do. I mean, I, we realized that Macworld, the, the expo had become small enough that we were thinking, you know, we could almost show people like literally wander through with a live view and show people every single booth that was at Macworld, <laughs> you know, which we, you know, would, would not have been doable, you know, before, uh, and let people ask questions while we're walking through. And we, we were threatening to do it. If we had one more day, we probably would have, um, uh, of course if we had one more day. We would have been dead. So, um, so anyway, so, uh, so it, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, it'll, it will uh, continue. I'm, I'm excited to see what they do next. I think that there, there's a lot of figuring out that needs to be done uh, when it comes to Macworld. Uh, and we've got, we've got some more, um, more news coming up here. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Apple changing its stance on water damage. We're also going to talk about the Apple TV. Uh, so a couple things coming up here. First of all, we want to thank uh, another one of our sponsors, and that is, of course, the leader in uh, online backup, Carbonite. And, um, and of course, Carbonite is, uh, here's the deal. You're, when you're, when you're thinking about, uh, uh, your backup plan, uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about is, is the, the need to, to make sure that you've got it in two places, but definitely somewhere off site. Now, if you're like me, you've got an office, you've got a house and you can put it up on both in both places, but you still got to get it into the cloud and, the, and because that's the only way you're, you know that the most important documents that you have, the most important photos of your kids, the most important uh, files that you want to make sure that you never lose are safe. And so, and Carbonite is a great way to do that. Um, you know, these are the things it's, it's, you know, if you have viruses, if you have hard drive failures, if you have water damage, if you're, if you have too much snow and you're, and you're not, I'm not trying not to scare you, Andy, but if you have, if you have too much snow and you're, and your and your roof caves in and, and gets your hard drives wet, you, you need to know that you have somewhere to go. So Carbonite is great to handle uh, all of those things, whether they're photos, videos, music, Word or Excel documents. Um, it's safe. Your files are encrypted on the way up or before they get up there. Um, it's easy to use. So if you're a novice, it's easy to just it's a couple clicks and, and off you go. Or if you're a techie, there's lots of customization that you can do. It's automatic. So uh, Carbonite backs up your files automatically. So you can just kind of set it up to just do it because it, it, it has to be automatic. So you're not thinking about it. You're not going, oh, I'll get around to it and, and so on and so forth. You're actually going to um, put it together. And, and it is... Uh, and your files, you know, it's just a couple of clicks and your files are backed up, you know, and it's a great way to, uh, to make sure that that works. So you get unlimited backup too. It's not like you, you get five gigs here or eight gigs there. It's an unlimited backup for your PC or Mac. And it's only $55 a year. That's only 15 cents a day. So um, definitely check it out. Um, you can try it for free by going to Carbonite.com and entering the offer code TWIT. So go to Carbonite. I'm sorry. Uh, car, offer code uh, MacBreak, not Twit. Um, so uh, go to the, you know in, enter MacBreak. Uh, go to Carbonite. You can try it out for free. See if this is something that you want. You'll get two months uh, for free, and you can see how how easy it is. And you can see uh, that you're you know hopefully uh, in those two months you don't have to deal with anything. Um, but you'll see how easy it is to set it up. So definitely go to Carbonite.com. Use the coupon code MacBreak and uh, and try it out. It's uh, you just you got to be thinking about uh, backing your stuff up in the cloud uh, with all of those things that you just, you know, you never want to lose. And it's not good enough to just have it in two places uh, because it's, you know, if you what happens if you get robbed? Uh, what happens if you, you know, if you have all those other things? And so those are the things I worry about when I leave um, my house because I have lots of things in there that I'm I mean, lots of data. I don't worry about the stuff. Was, that's the funniest thing is I don't worry about the stuff in my house. I worry about the data in my house or in my car or my laptop. And this is the best way to, to back it up. So definitely check it out. Carbonite.com. You were going to say something? No, I heard somebody, I, th I thought Andy was warming up. So, um, so we have a new, uh, <laughs> uh, we have a, uh, a, a change in Apple's stance on water damage. And, uh, this is something that people have been posting on the, you know, wanting us to talk about a little bit on, uh, on the, uh, the IRC. Um, so, in the past, it basically, there was an indicator that uh, if it, it turned red, uh, you know, basically they weren't going to give it back because it means you dropped it in the pond or in the glass or in the pool or, or whatever it is. Um, and uh, now, if a customer disputes whether this is, uh, the, if a customer disputes whether the iPod uh, with an activated LCI has been uh, damaged by liquid contact and there are no <coughs> external signs of damage, of corro corrosion, then the iPad will still be eligible for warranty service. Um, 
can I just say yeah. how how upset this whole thing makes me? Because that was really the way that I usually got to upgrade my phone. As a married guy, <laughs> you know, when a new version of the iPhone would come out, I had to find some way to discreetly, you know, cause mine to be uh, disabled. And dropping it in the toilet wasn't an obvious mistake that you could do. And uh, when my wife would say, well, just take it to the Apple store, I'd say, well, it's got the liquid uh, contact indicator in there. They'll know I dropped it in the toilet. I, I really need to get the, the iPhone 4 now. <laughs> and this has really ruined my whole thing. I'm going to have to drop it into something really corrosive now. It's much more difficult to find something corrosive to drop your phone into by accident. <laughs> Well, I'm oh, sorry, dear. I sir. The, 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 red, the red moisture indicator is on, but that's okay. What we're concerned about is the blue hydrochloric acid indicator. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that. definitely a no. Yeah. Actually, actually, the, the the interesting thing about this story is that it's. It, I think it pretty much just takes an unofficial uh, Apple Genius Bar policy and makes it, a, or at least puts it in print where the people can leak it out. Uh, because uh, I spent uh, a few, uh, a couple months ago, I spent some time investigating, uh, seeing exactly the limits of what the, uh, what the guys at the Genius Bar and the women at the Genius Bar could do. And I have really just discovered that there is an unofficial policy that I would term the we're awesome policy, where there's, they, have a, they have incredible latitude to fix any problem. Uh, and multiple people were telling me about times that they had brought a, they, they actually washed their iPhone. Uh, there was no doubt about it. They were honest and upfront about it. There, were, there was double red, triple red. And still they said, okay, well, you know, we, you, know, we tr we, you, 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 you were honest with us and you tried. So we, have a new, we, we will swap out a new one for you, even though it's uh, clearly out of warranty. And there are stories like this that abound and abound and abound. I talked to a whole bunch of uh, Apple geniuses. Uh, who uh, under the under the agreement that I wouldn't like talk about who they are uh, and that sort of stuff, but they pretty much confirmed that yeah, it, uh, both the uh, both the uh, current ones and the and the former ones were telling me that yeah, there's so many times when so long as you shoot straight with us and so long as we think that you tried to take care of your iPhone or your iPad, we'll try to take care of you. And the things that they were doing uh, to keep people happy was pretty incredible. I mean, I, I started it off when. I was trying to figure out if there was more breakages on the back glass panel on the new iPhone 4 than there was on previous ones. And if so, if that was going to be a, a swappable item. And time and time, so I, I, I essentially just simply did an open call for, if you have had a service experience via the Apple Store with an iPhone 4, I tried not to lead, lead the witness, could you get in touch with me because I'd like to hear what your story is. And multiple times I'd hear, <laughs> I, t I, I dropped it. The front screen, the, the actual like LCD screen broke. It was broken, broken, broken. It was my fault. It was clearly not a warranty issue, but they swapped it out for me anyway. So yeah, I was, I, it, I, yeah, I was actually surprised. Uh, my my uh, uh, my father dropped his. He, he bought his iPhone four, and within like the first week, had dropped it and cracked the front, and brought it back in. And they hemmed and hawed for a little while, and then they they uh, you know they replaced it. And now he has an otter box on it or something like that to make sure it never <laughs> never happens again. But I, you know, the um, it is interesting that. Uh, I've definitely found, I mean, I, I use up, I get my Apple, my Apple warranty, whatever that is. Um, I can't think of the name of it at the moment. Apple care, Apple care. Apple care. with everything because I, because of the way I use the, the hardware, um, t I tend to win. <laughs> I'm the, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm the guy that evens out all of those, all of those numbers. Um, uh, you know, rarely do I, do I, uh, do I lose money on, on that situation? I think there's a lot of people who take really good care of their stuff and, and never have that happen. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, and what I'm amazed at is how often my, how, how often these, these devices actually survive, um, a, uh, a warm wash. I, uh, I, 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 I left my iPhone, uh, my last iPhone in, um, in my sweats pocket and, uh, gave it a full warm cycle and the dry cycle, uh, before I, I heard the dry cycle going, dunk, 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 dunk. and I was like, <laughs> What could I have left in my in my pocket? And uh, opened it up. There it was. It was soaked. And uh, yeah, it wasn't working. And um, and I gave it to some. I I I, I didn't even try to take it in. I, I didn't even consider the idea that I that I, I I wasn't even going to try to have the conversation. It was too embarrassing. <laughs> and I gave it to someone in the office and I said, "Here, if you can make this work, then it's it's yours." Because I I'm I'm done. And uh, he soaked it in rice for uh, yep. for for two days. And uh, he's still using it, as far as I know. Yeah. You know, it's, I did. Go ahead, I, I, I try to batch a home remedies for that uh, to, on what to do with soaked hardware. And that clearly, it was obviously the best one. Just take a, take dry white rice, put it in a Ziploc baggie with the device, whatever it is, seal it so that you're not, so it's going to be, the rice is going to be drawing moisture from the device instead of the atmosphere. Leave it for a couple of days. If there's any chance whatsoever, uh, it'll come out. And, and w it, it, for, for your phone, it still smells springtime fresh. <laughs> <laughs> was, so you, you won. 
<laughs> I, I just don't know if it would have survived the hot wash. It was just warm, <laughs> not hot. So I, I don't know. We'll have to, I might have to test that. No. The key to the the key going back to the the Mac geniuses. The key to dealing with those guys or even any sort of general support is just be nice. I mean, if you're a nice to the person when you go in there, and if you're honest and you just are friendly, they're going to be a lot more willing to help you out and make your day a little bit better than if you come in there shooting flames. I think that there's a, I, there's a quote that my father uh, really enjoyed uh, saying with uh, related to Harvey. I think it was you know or the uh, yes, that is, it is important Harvey. to be oh so ever clever or oh so ever nice. Or and oh, oh so ever pleasant. No, 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 in this in this in this world, one must be either oh so clever or oh so pleasant. I've been oh so clever. Being oh so pleasant is better. Yeah, <laughs> I prefer being. Pleasant. <laughs> but yeah, I think that that's that's the case in a lot of. I mean, that's the case in many things. Uh, you know, is is the first thing to do is is to be up. You know, straightforward and uh, and nice. You were saying, Justin? Though? No, I'm just saying, like, especially when I deal with support, I get a lot of email and. 90% of the people are nice and I'm more than willing to help these people. And then, but then you get the people that just assume that you're not going to help them. And they just, they're calling you all the names in the book. And I see this <laughs> in my email, or I see it even when I go to the Apple store to buy a new piece of software or an accessory, you see some people that go up to the genius bar and they're just fighting with the genius right out of the gate as if it's some sort of mortal crime that they have committed against them. And just, that's not the way to get what you need out of people. It's just, just be nice. Yeah, you can always you can always tell the people who are former Best Buy, you know, Geek Squad customers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't don't try to be an expert either. That doesn't really help. Yeah, it's it's uh, it, I think, and that's just generally anybody who has authority. You know, uh, most of the time, I uh, uh, you know, I I had a um, a bit of a driving problem when I was a kid that my my <laughs> foot was much heavier than the gas pedal. I mean, it was it was like this physics problem that you know I, I tried to get treatment for, and and my foot just kept on just sinking down and I, and I got pulled over um uh 22 times um mm. between the time I was 16 and 18 and uh um and I got two tickets um and it was mostly because I was really nice <laughs> 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 I think it, it turned out that well and I talked to a police officer about it and he said you know 30 percent of all police officers are shot that are shot in the line of duty are shot at a police stop you know so uh, you know a routine yeah. stop and so they're very afraid of you when they come out and if you make it so that it's a nice relaxing conversation for them uh it's oftentimes a nice relaxing conversation for you uh, depending, yeah. on, depending on the police officer so uh so anyway here's a here's another stat that is starting to come up this is according to netflix netflix is saying that the uh apple tv uh streaming is happening more often on the apple tvs uh, so, so there. Netflix streaming, of course, is available. Um, you know, on your, you can do it on your iPad, on your Apple TV, too, um, on your computer. And they're now saying that the the highest percentage, or the higher the higher percentage, is on the Apple TV rather than the iPad, uh, yeah. which you know <laughs> is is quite a. Th I mean, yeah, people are actually well, watching content on a TV. Andy. Exactly. Well, that, that's that's why it's a fascinating statistic. It turns out that people like to watch television on televisions. Well, here's the funny thing about that is that is that I uh, so I had taken my stationary bike and and I had rigged it up because I couldn't you know I, I didn't want to get another Roku and I and I had I rigged it all up um, with all this metal and everything else so that I could have my iPad sitting you know right in front of my stationary like right over the bike and uh, and started watching Netflix started streaming Netflix on it and it was fine uh, and then I hooked a um, I got the new Apple TV too. Finally, I was kind of delaying on it, and I finally and I attached it to a slightly larger monitor. And um, man, it's addicting. Mm -hmm. I will say. Well, I, I've watched one movie on my iPad, and it's doable, but I don't get the appeal of doing that. I'd much rather use my Apple TV hooked up to my 42 inch television to watch Netflix. And the experience of the Apple TV Netflix integration is by far superior to the iPad or even any other console or, the or Roku. platform that you use. I mean, yeah. the thing is, yeah. the, the crazy thing is, is that I, you know, I have a Roku and, and after I got the Apple TV working on my, on my TV, uh, I went over to the, into the family room and I ripped the Roku out and I installed the Apple TV and I was like, okay, I'm done with that. <laughs> you, know, you know, like I, you know, this is a much easier way to get around, much easier way to start and stop, much easier way to do all the things in it. The, the interface is just easier to use. It's simple. It's not that much different, but it's, it's enough different that it was much easier to, to, to do what I wanted to do on, on the Apple two, uh, on the Apple TV two. The Apple TV one, I, you know, I bought it, I used it for 10 minutes and, uh, and then it sat in some 
You know, at first it sat under my TV for t- six months until I moved my TV and then I put it in, the, in a closet somewhere. You know, so it's not like I, I you know, the Apple TV too, I think it really hit it. Now, does, does everyone have one here or is... Yeah. Do we I all have, have the, the only no. Go ahead. The only advantage the Apple TV one had over the, the second generation one is there was so much more content. The, it doesn't seem like they've added too much content to this whole rental scheme that they've set up with the next generation version, which is frustrating because there's a lot of movies that I want to watch on my Apple TV and I search for them. Um, on my, when I'm sitting there on the couch and I can't find them and I just have to go and grab my iPad or grab my MacBook Air, search for it on iTunes, see that it is available and then get it through there. That's that's frustrating to me because that wasn't the case with the previous generation. Yeah, so it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that how that how that moves forward. I do I do find that now with Netflix, um, if you know, I don't I got a lot of content. I don't really you know, between Netflix and my home library, uh, you know, I have a hard time justifying paying for rental. Like I, I accidentally got into the I, the Apple, you know, store and I was like, why is all my Netflix costing three ninety nine? What happened? Are they changing everything? And I was like, I was all, I was all freaked out. I was like, this is going to ruin everything. And then I was like, oh, I'm in the wrong room. I'm in the wrong room. I can, I can, I can, I can move, move along and, and, uh, and get back to my, to my little environment. And, uh, but it is interesting that Apple has built the best, um, platform for Netflix. Now, one of the things, one of the rumors that we're hearing now is Amazon is looking at doing a subscription service for, uh, Pr- Amazon prime members. Uh, do we think that, do we think that we're going to see, will Apple TV do an update and start supporting Amazon? No. Sure. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. No, I mean, well, 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 because yeah. Amazon is selling purchase content, whereas Netflix is just doing subscriptions. Well, Amazon's talking about doing a subscription. So the idea is if you're an Amazon Prime, the rumor is, is that if you're already doing Amazon Prime, that you would get access to up to 5,000. No, no, no. no I'm, say, I'm saying I, I know that they're uh, the, the rumor is that they're getting into the subscription game. But Apple, the, the, the only reason, the reason why Apple would not do it is that Apple would also, excuse me, Amazon would also be very, very pleased if instead of purchasing stuff from the iTunes store, you actually purchase stuff from the Amazon digital store. So that when you, the next time you want to, you know, see the next, uh, the, the, the next uh, Judah Freelander film, uh, you paid uh, $12 not to Apple, but to, but to Amazon. So I think that they, I don't know, if we'll, 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 we'll test out the parameters of the is Apple a bunch of evil money grubbing scum uh, if that were to happen. And if we just see if, if, if the test will be not if to Apple put them on the spot. Them, yeah. Well, also, well, also, there's the question that they have yet to support Amazon uh, uh, digital streaming, even though Amazon is one of those features that you tend to find on just about every uh, HDMI, HDTV, internet box that you find. I think there, are, I got three in the house right now that can co- that can uh, access uh, Amazon digital content. So why is that one app not available on the Apple TV? By the way, one of the things that I noticed with my Apple uh, TV too is that. Um, in case you wonder whether the cheap HDMI cables are any different than the expensive HDMI cables, <laughs> that it turns out that when you're connecting your Apple TV 2 to your to your uh, TV, it makes a difference. Um, you know, I had the three dollar HDMI cables, and I was getting the HDCP uh, error, so you know it doesn't you know it can't can't sync. And um, I went through a bunch of complaining i i think i, I might have tweeted a couple angry notes um and uh and then finally put in a much more expensive uh 40 cable and it has worked fine ever since and now, 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 my now i just want to look at damn as, you monster damn you anyway that's, that's all I have to say. my question as a developer is when are they going to let us write applications for the apple tv I mean, well, it is an iOS yes. device at this point. Why can't I write apps that run on it? That's exactly where I was going with that. So, so the the issue is, is now that we have the Apple TV. Now that it's it's over a million sales, uh, we ha- we have we have a platform there, and it is iOS. I mean, it's just iOS. There's nothing else to it other than it's a little box that runs iOS. Uh, when do you think we're going to get uh, see? When is Apple going to open that up? I mean, there's been a lot of when you talk to people at Apple. There's a lot of wink, wink, nod, nod. Like you know, we know that it can. It could run any of this. Is is most of this a an interface issue? Do you think that Apple's trying to figure out how are you going to interface with your Apple TV that would be different than your iPhone? Do you th- I think AirPlay I think is their platform. The event- Sorry, go ahead, Justin. No, so so I think AirPlay is going to be their platform for the Apple TV, just because I can't really think of that many applications that I would want for an Apple TV beyond just playing audio and video content. Angry and so Birds. if you enable. Angry Birds. Do you really want to play Angry Birds on your TV? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yes. but no, but l- look at it this way, though. So here's how you would do it, though. You would grab your iPhone. 
you say, use AirPlay, send the video content up to my Apple TV, and then you control it using your iPhone. I don't think that you're ever going to see an iOS app store for the Apple TV directly. I think what you're going to find is a lot more applications for the iPhone and the iPad enable you to push the video content from the app onto your Apple TV and subsequently onto your television. Maybe, but it seems like a lot of work just to get just to, I mean, it seems, when you yeah. have a device that already is capable of running the application, running it through virtually seems like it's a lot of uh, it seems like it's going to, going to affect uh, performance. Andy? I think that it's going to be more, I think the first thing we're going to see before the full app store, uh, you know, the full app thing is going to be just the idea of WebKit coming on to Apple TV and any remote service that wants to create an Apple TV sort of service or an Apple TV, whatever widget uh, will, be, will be able to do that, not by pushing an application, but by simply pushing an alert to app. There'll be like an Apple TV inbox that simply says, oh, because you uh, essentially I'll go onto I'll go onto Flickr dot com. I'll say, oh, by the way, I have an Apple TV. Here's my Apple ID. Could you please like direct give me access to the Flickr web tool uh, that gives me more power than simply slideshows and then i would find an inbox item uh, in my uh, in my apple tv i click on that link unbeknownst to the user it's just simply opening a web page that has th that really cool html5 sort of interface to it i think that the, the, the biggest problem with apple developing apps for the uh, for for the web uh, for the apple tv is just simply describing here is the the unit of interface between the user and the apple tv well and, and, and uh, it's part it's part of the problem, though, the the issue of Apple not wanting to make the Apple TV too complicated is is, is, is part of well, the issue. Like we don't want you, we want you to just think of it as a, I mean, Apple does this a lot. We want to give you something like they gave us an iPhone without any anything that, you know, and we complained and complained that we don't have applications. And now they've sold, is it 10 billion, 10 billion mm -hmm. applications uh, or, 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 or distributed 10 billion applications. And so is the question like we want to get you focused on using the Apple TV the way we designed it and then we're going to open it up. Do you think that's the, it's a, is it a step-by-step -step process? Yeah, I think so. Remember what they've done with the iPad and what they did with the iPhone. The iPhone, day one, did about 60% of what every competing smartphone at that time could do. And we had to wait a couple of a years. And we still bought it because we're suckers. suckers. Oh, no, because the, 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 the whole package was good. It was okay to do without cut and paste for a while if the, the non-cutting and non-pasting apps still kick the butt of everything I could do on my BlackBerry or on my Windows Windows smartphone. So I, I do think that that's coming, but Apple's never been in a, in a rush to meet anybody else's timetable but their own. Very interesting. So, I mean, what would you, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron what would you write for the Apple TV that, that would be new and different? So uh, just thinking about social media, you could do chat, you could do a browser Facebook page. There's uh, opportunities like that. There's media, so you could imagine applications that would be musical so that you could compose there in front of your TV. Uh, my TV has a decent sound system, a lot better than my phone. Uh, that might be a, a nice way to work with it. Yeah, I, yeah the, the FaceTime is something that I that I seem, I feel like would be really interesting, you know, with, with, it, you know, being able to put that into my, especially as I think about my parents, you know, with, mm -hmm. you know, with my parents, uh, you know, not, not wanting to have a lot of stuff they're carrying around, not quite, but having something that's, that's stationary that people can be using their iPhone and calling in or, or going from Apple TV to Apple TV. It just seems like it'd be so Jetsons. <laughs> so, um, so the anyway. future. The future. Yes, exactly. It, it's, uh, it's the future as envisioned in 1962 by the World's Fair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Future it's 1977. Whoa! <laughs> Moon men are mixing you drinks with robotic nuclear power. So now here's here's an interesting uh, little uh, tidbit. Um, Apple, uh, not Apple, AT and T. Okay, we got Verizon coming out. It's uh, going to be available at uh, midnight, I believe, um, on uh, on the third. Um, and uh, so for, for current users, and then the 10th uh, for everybody else, uh, AT&T is reportedly quietly offering cons um, uh, customers unlimited <coughs> iPhone data plans, again, to try to, you know, let's hang on to them. Uh, so this is, a, um, this is according to Apple Insider and, uh, and according to the Associated Press. And so it's, it's basically an unadvertised loophole uh, that they're trying to retain some of the customers um, who contact customer service. So seems like the thing to do here, whether you are planning to leave or not, and you don't have the unlimited plan, uh, is it to at least do a little saber rattling. Uh, Andy, do you see yourself uh, rattling? Oh, you don't have to rattle the saber. Exactly. Well, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to be free of the fear that 
if I were to just sort of send one text message too many, they would use that as well because because we, we noticed you sent ten more text messages that are in your existing plan. We have switched you to an expanded plan that gives you more free text messages, and because we switched you to a new plan, we've also taken it off the free unlimited. Anyway. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm traveling. I'm traveling to Europe in a couple of weeks. I'm like, do I really? Should I switch it to the to the international roaming plan and st and risk that they won't? They will use it as an, as an excuse to take me off of uh, unlimited. Uh, but it's, uh, even now, I'm sort of thinking that this is sort of like a disinformation program to say if we make them think that they could switch back at any time, maybe this last the last the last 500,000 people who are still giving unlimited internet to, who are streaming Netflix 24 hours a day just to stick it to the man, will come back. Yes, yes, yes. I, yeah, it's, uh, I have to admit, I, I'm also terrified of losing my unlimited plan. Uh, you know, yes. it's, it's one of those things that I, I and, I, and it, was, it scared me the first time, but the international plan for me, I spent too much time outside the United States, and so I'm, I'm constantly turning it on and off, um, which you can do, by the way. And here's something else that, that you can do is you can actually, if you forgot about it, you can actually call AT&T three days into your trip to Japan and they will back. If you ask for it, they'll actually, you'll say, oh, I forgot to turn this on. And they go, oh, we'll just set the date three days before or four days before and start it up. So it's actually a pretty flexible little thing. And so far, as far as I know, I haven't lost my unlimited data. But of course, I don't really know what goes on with my bills. My wife will tell me. And uh, there's so many people attached to my, my plan. I don't. I don't know. So, um, so anyway, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, any other news that we should uh, be covering? Did I miss anything uh, that that, uh, that we have there? I think we're I think we're uh, winding down here. Um, uh, we're going to get to the picks of the week. Uh, we're going to start going around. And this is a warning for uh, for Aaron and Justin that we're coming with the picks of the week. But before that, we want to thank, of course, uh, Audible dot com. Uh, Audible, of course, is uh, the the way, uh, the best way to um, to read books, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, it's funny. I was talking, to, uh, you know, talking to my dad uh, uh, last night about some other stuff, and he's like, he was talking about the the girl who kicked the hornet's nest, and and he said, oh, I love that book, and I, and, and I was like, when do you actually read that book? And he goes, oh, I didn't read it. I listened to it on Audible. You know, like you know, like the idea, my, my, the, 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 you know, that it's getting mainstream when my dad goes. I didn't read it. I mean, come on now. I mean, you, know, you wouldn't even consider that. And so, you know, audible.com is, is really the best way to do that. It, it is a, um, you got 75,000 books that are downloadable. Uh, titles, everything from literature, uh, fiction, nonfiction, periodicals, uh, you know, and, um, and for <laughs> listeners of uh, MacBreak, Audible is offering a free audiobook to, so you can try it out. So if you haven't done this before, you got to go up. It's free. There, it doesn't cost anything. There's no risk. Go up there and, uh, and, and, and download a free book and see whether it's something that, that works for you. I know that it's something that I'm um, just downright addicted to. Um, I don't really consider... Uh, yeah, I don't like unitasking. I think that's the bottom line. I'm, I'm, I'm an anti-unitasker. Uh, you know, I, I know that I, Aaron, I think, you know, constantly is, well, not constantly, but during our class, when I was, well, when I was in Aaron's fine class, there was, a, I was talking about a, a need for focus. It's not something I'm pretty, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm good at. It's, it's not, I'm, I'm, I, I like to think about six things at one time. And, um, and maybe, maybe it's slowing me down, but Audible is the perfect thing for me. It allows me to, to, uh, uh, to to clean my house, to drive, to walk, and uh, still continue to uh, accumulate lots of useless information. So um, so anyway, definitely check it out. And of course, if you're thinking about it, Andy generally has a suggestion of something that you might want to think about uh, downloading. Yep, uh, my last pick was a couple of weeks ago, and I finished I finished that during one of the transcontinental flights to San Francisco uh, sideways, which was uh, definitely delivered the goods. Uh, the next one I haven't uh, I barely started my next one. Uh, it's a nonfiction book that will uh, really have importance to a lot of people who are listening right now. It's called The Emperor of All Maladies: A Biography of Cancer, and I will never pronounce the author's name right, and I will not uh, offend. Uh, I'll offend the author by trying. Um, but uh, it's a really fascinating story in which uh, the, the author is an onco oncologist who, after uh, uh, starting the specialty of oncology, decided to keep a journal just a, as just his way of sort of keeping grounded and keeping sane because it's, a, it's an incredibly challenging field to work in. Uh, and this journal sort of spun out into research and the, the history of cancer, the story of development, not only starting with 4,000 years ago, the first documented cancer treatments, which was, as you can guess, pretty barbaric, to the ongoing attitudes about the disease, about how in the 19th century, 
Uh, the first real breakthrough came in when the understanding that all living things are made out of cells and sometimes these cells just sort of go nuts and that's the basis of all cancer. Before then, it was just this weird malady that would just, if you got it, boom, you're going to die horribly uh, within weeks. You would still get, and then in the 20th century where Filled, filled with hubris. Uh, this, or this, this is the story that the, the book seems to seems to tell. That early on, doctors and the, the scientists were sort of filled with hubris that cancer patients were just pretty much just objects that you treat the hell out of, then without really caring about what they're what they're going through, without really caring about whether or not this treatment that they're going to try out on them is going to do any good or extend their lives or extend their quality of their lives at all. And the and the book talks a lot about what these treatments are uh, and how absolutely radical the, a lot of these treatments were. And then it goes to the the, the, the periods in which there was, they get their first successes where they see that, you know, we managed to put cancer into remission for the very, very first time. A, a kid who was very near death, uh, who had been sick for a year and a half, they gave him, him this brand new uh, intravenous treatment. And two weeks later, he was sitting up and actually talking and, and, and eating and extended his life. So and there's also lots of personal stories about modern treatment, about uh, what cancer patients go through uh, in, in modern times and the, the, what, the, what the process is of going from a Rhodes Scholar and just being a regular doctor to committing to this at times just horrible, horrible, horribly uh, tough uh, emotionally uh, practice to, to, to go into. Uh, it's it's uh, like so many other people, I've lost uh, very, very close members of my family to cancer. And so it really gives you an idea of what the entire world is up against, the successes, the failures, and if anything else, the optimism that you know that uh, if the, you know that there are people who are working on this day and night, that there are people who have gone through this and gotten to the other side of it. Uh, and the most hopeful part of this entire book is the explanation that there are people who are actually cured of cancer, uh, and that it's it, it really it does tell you about the entire universe of this disease. And it's it's not, a, I've read a lot of uh, nonfiction books where I was more attracted to the topic than the writing. Uh, there's a book about the, the the engineering behind the lunar lander written by the program manager. <laughs> They're just like, okay, so why did you switch from 5 sixteenths to 2 eighths thread, thread screws for the paneling displays again? And he's going to tell you every detail of how that screw uh, was was developed. Uh, but this is more of a story. Uh, the, uh, the, the author is an exceptionally good storyteller and it's just eminently readable from start to finish so uh, again I've, I haven't finished it. I've only gotten through the first uh, I as I usually do when I sample a, an, aud an audible book is that I'll actually uh, download the uh, the the Kindle version where I can read the first bits of it then I'll uh, start listening to about the the five minute sample that's available on audible.com just to make sure that you know that the the, the reader is someone that I, that I like uh, and I'm only about two or three chapters in but already I've actually sort of like stopped it because I know that I'm flying to Europe <laughs> next next uh, in a couple of weeks. I need something for the plane rides over, and I want to save something good. And this is really good. I know, you know, for me, I, I get into these books, and I and, and and when I finish one, I feel so, you know, it's like it's there, and I almost want to listen to it again. You know, like yeah, I, you know, the, the, and I'm the, scared the, the, of committing to another one. Like yeah. I've just finished this one, and then it takes me a little while. There's like this little break where I don't yeah. listen to anything because I don't know what to do next. I kind of, you know, that was so good. The only disappointing thing about so many of these Audible books is that at least when I'm reading a book, a physical book, I can, when I was reading a paper book, I could sense that, okay, the pages in this side of my hand are getting thinner than the yeah. pages on this side. I'm getting, I need to, I need to emotionally get ready for the time when I get to the end of this book and I, and I don't, I, I cannot read any more of this. With Audible, it's like, you just like, you're, you're this beautiful chapter, like, oh boy, that's wonderful. <laughs> what are the next chapters about? This was an Audible book. Yeah. yeah Go I, to Audible. Oh no, no, I got no, sorry. No, don't go, audible guy, please. And I got back to I was listening. I was listening to Thousand Hills from Stephen Kinzer about Rwanda, and you know I've I've been with him through through the, the you know revolution and genocide and rebuilding the country, and then we get to the end and it's gone. It's like okay, well, what's the update? I mean, do you have something else I can listen to? I mean, I I feel like I just got there. Yeah. So uh, anyway, check it out. Uh, Audible.com slash MacBreak. Uh, Audible.com slash MacBreak. Get your free book today and uh, and try it. And I I just apologize. Uh, uh, right now for the addiction that will come soon after. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's just such a great service. Um, so anyway, so now we have our picks for the week. Um, and I'm going to throw this back to uh, Andy because I'm sure that he's ready for his pick of the week. Andy? Uh, I am ready and I'm not ready in the sense that uh, my pick of the week is a, an awesome device that first got on the, the radar uh, several months ago when it started off as a Kickstarter project. I finally got my hold, my hands on a, a real one last week at the show because they had a, they had a, they had a booth there. Uh, it's called the Glyph. 
and you can t check it out at uh, theglyph.com. Uh, it is the is such brilliant engineering. What it is is it is a hybrid iPhone 4 stand that can be used to hold up the iPhone in any configuration you want it to be. And here you're picturing your mind, oh, it's a stupid, like, bulky, like, Big Mac size tripod attachment with a big screw mount that you'll never ever use. No, what it is, it's like a 3D of uh, uh, high impact plastic bookmark that you don't really know how to use it until you see it being used, and then you realize that uh, you it's a it's a it's a it's a kickstand with a clip on this uh, on the end of it. It's about this big, like let's like like a kind of like a, a a field hockey stick. I'm sorry I don't have it with me. Only because it's so small, it's somewhere in my bag, and I've yet to find it, but I know it's in there somewhere. Uh, so it's a $20 little thing. You can hold it up. One, you can use it. You can clip it onto the top of that, that, that square edge of the iPhone and just simply use it as... Uh, and just simply use it as just a, a lean-to stand uh, that's that's on your desk. Or you can clip it the other way and and hold it up vertically because it's not like a, a, a like a like a like a, a banana case. It's just a clip that simply adds a little stand, a little kickstand to it. So vertically, horizontally, doesn't make a difference. Or because the actual longitude of it is a uh, is a, a little rail that that clips onto the side of it accurately, you can also clip it on like that, and then you have a tripod screw mount at the bottom of it. So it will work on any tripod that you have, and will work horizontally or it will work vertically. And it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little device. Again, it's about this big. Uh, it's twenty bucks, but it's uh, it's better than so many of these little uh, stands and adapters that I've seen that cost two or three times as much for the. Uh, for the, uh, by the simple virtue of the fact that you will actually have this with you when you need it. You will actually carry it with you. It will be the stand that you always use. I'm not a big fan of these kickstands. Uh, sometimes you'll find cases and other stands that will uh, let you prop up your iPhone. I, I like them in that there are times when, uh, when I like to have it on my desk so I can actually keep an eye on the timer, keep an eye on a timer that I've got running on what I'm saying. But I just never find it worth the bother taking with me. Uh, and the Glyph is so good that I will always, always have them with me. I, I picked up actually three of them. Uh, and there's one of them that will always be in my laptop bag, one of them that will always be in the suitcase, always travel with, and one that I'll probably lose pretty quickly because they're tiny 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 objects that's how convenient they are well, so, and i love the story behind them too you know, the, the yep. whole you know so these guys uh, the developers I, I talked to them a little bit at the at the show they um they thought of you know a really good idea and then they built a 3d model of it and then they printed it with um with uh, shapeways shapeways is this company where you can email your your file to them and they'll send it back to you printed out. And so they had it printed, and then, and then there's this little uh, – then they put a, what, what's called a quarter-inch 20 tap into it, which, which allows you to screw this onto your tripod if you, if you want to. Um, and, and, then they, and they so then they showed it, and they made a video about all the different ways that you could use it. And, and um, you know, this is – you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, and they put it on Kickstart. So is, is, is that right? Kickstart.com? Kickstarter. Kickstarter.com. And, uh, and put it up there so people can bid on, you know, people, you can help fund them and help. And then they said, right. you, you can have one, you know, if you help us fund but it. it they, right. The, the, the basis of the funding is that we don't have the money to, to build these. But if, if, uh, if we raise $15,000, that's enough for us to do the tooling and actually manufacture these. If you give us a dollar just on principle, thank, we'll, we'll thank you very much. If you give us 15 or $20, we'll actually send you one. If you give us $100, we'll send you two and we will drive to your house and kiss you on the lips. Uh, and they, with all these, these Kickstarter projects, the point is that you have to set exactly how much money you need and how much time, a time limit on how much time to raise it. And so many times it's like, we need $100,000 to do a video on, uh, on jazz in, in upper, upper Mongolia and they'll get like $500. They were trying to rise t raise 10 grand and they raised $130,000. It was such a great idea. Yeah, yeah. So. And it's just, and it is, uh, and when you see it in use. Yes, there you go. So I was hoping you'd have a picture yeah, of it Yeah, yeah, I, I had to, a little yeah. computer. And, and, it, yeah, and, and, it's, and it's, so, it is so wonderful because if you were to, if, if I were to leave this behind in a, in, in, in a bar, uh, no one would, people would think it was like a, a bottle opener or something. They would never figure out that it's an iPhone stand. But the minute you see one person using it, the next question is going to be, what is that? And what kind of, how can I get one for myself? It's such a clever idea. You, you almost want to just give them 20 bucks just on principle for being such a bunch of clever little boots. Yeah, I have to admit, my brother is like, never buys any of this stuff. And as soon as we finished shooting an episode about it there, um, he was like, okay, I need to go get one of those. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, it's great. It's the best 20 bucks you'll spend as far as supporting yep. your uh, your iPod. Okay, Aaron, you're up next. All right. So you probably know the Big Nerd Ranch does training. Uh, we teach people how to do iPhone programming and Mac, top, Mac 
desktop programming. But we also do a lot of consulting work. And one of the things that we've been dealing with lately is big corporations have become fascinated with the iPad. And in particular, the idea of using the iPad as sort of a window into their huge databases so that they can look at their existing data. And so we've been really doing a lot of deep thinking about how to present information. And not just information, but really knowledge on the iPad. And I, one thing you don't know about me is I'm a really bad saxophone player. So <laughs> I came across the History of Jazz iPad app. And uh -oh. I have to say, it's just incredible. It's an incredible way of getting an understanding of jazz and how it evolved over time and through different threads. And just as a triumph of the future of when we take books and we merge them with video and interactive uh, learning processes, the history of jazz is kind of where we're all going. And I think it's an interesting look at uh, where, where we're going to expect to see everything in a few years. Very interesting. So it's uh, and it's available. It is uh, somehow I ended up in the Apple dot com uh, uh, UK, but it is um, uh, there. It is, here it is. Uh, History of jazz, and it is uh, I guess eight bucks or nine bucks. Um, trying to make it, I'm make, trying to make it quick. I I, I did that. Of course, you Google and you and you end up in. Uh, uh, it is nine dollars and ninety nine cents. Nine ninety nine. It's only it's five ninety nine in in uh, pounds in in uh, in the UK, but nine ninety nine. And it's uh, and if you're into jazz, that's place to go or if uh, you're just into the idea of information design laying things out so, so, people, so you're just as far as just as just a reference of putting all this stuff together which i think is important because i think that there is a uh yeah there's when it comes to e-learning education and so on and so forth i think these these are going to be great platforms and we still haven't figured out exactly how to make all of that exactly and this is an indication of where we're going fantastic i'm going to get it just for that so uh, yep. uh definitely check it out justin what do you got all right us? i'm going to use my liberty and have two picks so my first pick is on the Mac App Store. It's a great app if you're a developer because one of the things we have to do with Objective-C is we have to create these accessor methods. And basically these are ways that we can mutate and change our variables in a little bit of a safer way. And it's a little bit easier to do this now with Objective-C 2.0 and what we have called properties, but it's still a lot of manual typing. And then there's, there's this great $20 application by a guy called Kevin Callahan called Accessorizer that I'm really starting to use a lot more now because basically what it allows me to do is create some in, some variables and say, all right, I want to create an NS integer, I want to create an NS string, and then I pop it into Accessorizer, click a button, it generates the properties for me as well as the synthesized statements and the deallocation stuff so that all I have to do then is just paste that into my class file in Xcode. And so it's 20 bucks, it's up on the Mac App Store, and it really saves me a lot of typing. And this, it's, autocomplete helps a little bit with this, but when you're working in Xcode all day, saving every little keystroke you can is a really good thing. So check it out, search for it at, on that Mac App Store. He's got a really great video on the front page of the site Alex was just showing. So if you go to uh, bit.ly slash accessorizer, you can just watch this video and it gives you a quick demo of all the cool stuff you can do with this application. Um, my second pick is a charity related thing. And uh, some of you might remember about a year ago, I put on this charity fund called Indie Relief, which was basically built around doing a one day charity event where developers gave their day sales for the Haitian Relief Fund. And I'm not doing that again this year, but my pal Scotty is doing a charity fund called Developers Against Poverty. And it's running over the next two months and it's at developersagainstpoverty.org. And basically what he's trying to do is raise $50,000 to give clean water to people who don't have it using a popular charity that a lot of people might have heard of called Charity Water. And you can, developers are going to start contributing to this and giving sales however they see fit. Or if you're just a consumer, you can just go and give a donation to it. And his ultimate goal is $50,000. And so I'd really like to see him to be able to get that because in a world where we're able to have iPads and buy new iPhones every year, there's still people out there who aren't getting clean water. And that's not a good thing. So I'd really hope that we can raise this goal for him. Is this the, uh, is this the ad with, uh, oh, hold on, you got to see the ad for this. Hold on. Uh, have you seen this ad? No. No, I haven't. It is the ad that they do for Charity Water. Hold on. Let me make sure I got my uh, MacBook uh, volume up here. Um, let's see here. Let's
anyway, I think it's just a, such a great ad, you know, for and making it very clear. And I, I do a lot of work in Africa. And so it's it is very much that problem, you know. And so anyway, it's a great, um, really, really great uh, organization that's putting that together. Did you have anything else you want to say about that, Justin? Um, I think that's pretty much it. Just uh, developersagainstpoverty.org or twitter.com slash devs against pov, I believe. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And uh, okay, I guess I guess I have to think of something really quickly. So um, no, I, I have uh, I, so I I had to use it for a little while. I talked about it, I think, on at CES, and I talked about it, and I um, and I, I finally can go ahead and recommend it. It took me, you know, and I I should have brought the piece of hardware. I forgot the hardware. I was rushing out to get here this morning. Um, so my recommendation is going to be the eye grill. So people have been making fun of it. I just want to say people were making fun of the eye grill at, at Macworld. They were like, you know, when they talked about the most absurd thing they saw at Macworld, they were like, okay, there's a heat, therm there's a, there's a meat thermometer that you can hook, you can connect to your iPhone. That's just crazy. Well, I have to say that I have one and, uh, and, uh, and, and I didn't, they didn't send it to me as a demo. I bought it. <laughs> I was like, I paid, I paid good money for it. And, um, and I've tested it now on, 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 on a few, um, some tri-tip and, uh, and a chicken and some lamb. And, uh, and so here's the deal. So if, if you're going to buy a barbecue uh, and you want to buy the Mac of barbecue, you get a big green egg. That's what they call them, these big green eggs. And uh, you have a lot of those down there in, in, uh, in, in Atlanta, don't you, Aaron? Because that's where they're... Oh, yeah. Big green egg is based here. It's a yeah. cult here. So I have a big green egg. I have, I have, I have my big green egg. And, and when you, one of the things about the big green egg is that it keeps all the temp, all the heat in. And so what you don't want to do is constantly be opening up your barbecue. You want to keep it shut and you've got a little temperature gauge, the big green egg, you can put the temperature gauge, there's a, one on the outside and you can check it out. But most people who use a big green egg that I know, uh, and once you have one, it's like a Mac, like once you have one, suddenly you just start running into all these people and you start talking about it. And, you, and it's literally like, it's like a Mac for barbecue. And um, anyway, so the thing is, is you want to have a remote temperature gauge and then you, but you also don't want to stand around looking at it. So I've bought all these remote gauges. They're, they're Bluetooth or whatever they are. And so what you can do is you stick this, it's got a little transmitter and you stick it in, but then you've got this big, crazy thing that you're carrying around. And I'm like, I don't want to carry this around. I don't want anything. I, I, I only thing I want to interface with is my iPhone. You know, I want everything. I want my, my refrigerator and my washer and dryer and my toaster and, and my and my coffee and everything else just to go into one interface. I think people should just stop thinking about that and just make things that work with my iPhone. And um, and so this is a great example. So what this is, all it is is a remote sensor. It's a little box. And then and then you've got, and I think I got, hold on, let me just move this up here. Um, Can't wait to go to Big Green Egg World next year. Oh, I want to go. I, you know, I want to cover it. You know, like like we cover Mac World. You know, I I want uh, to I, I want to cover. Smell a lot better than any ex any other exposure. <laughs> oh man, it's, yeah, exactly. So so this is this this is what it looks like here. So you can see it here. It's this little box with a little heat, a uh, little meat thermometer, and uh, and you can actually have two different sensors plugged into the same one. And and then what what happens is is that you get. Everything goes into your iPhone, so then you can go back to watching the Steelers, and um, and uh, so you're watching the Steelers play, uh, watching them win, of course, because they're the Steelers, and uh, and then they, but you can, it'll it'll give you a little, uh, you actually get a graph that shows you the the trajectory of your meat, so you can see like when it's going to be, uh, like you know, it, it tells you, you know, roughly, you know, you can see this little this little graph going up. There's a couple things that I would, you know, it's it when it's in the background, the the graph restarts, and and there's a, there's a couple little things like that, but. But overall, it, it the interface is beautiful and it's just very Mac like and uh, and it, it, it's just a great um, you know I just anyway I'm just very happy with it and so and I, and one of the reasons I wanted to recommend it was specifically because people saw it at MacWorld and said it was crazy and I was like it's not crazy if you know what if you know what it's used for it's just great so anyway if you like uh -huh. meat you love the eye grill yes yes well, you hate how much meat, that's why run? you hate the grill. it's a it's a i believe it's a hundred dollars hold on let me see i, I think it's a hundred dollars for the sensor uh i mean for the for the box and then the um and then it is a uh um yes yeah, a hundred dollars and then if you want uh, an extra sensor you you can, you can uh, it'll be an additional twenty dollars for the for the second sensor and the reason you want second sensor is if you've got you know chicken and beef on the same grill you want to do it as or someone who is constantly on the verge of poisoning myself when cooking. I'm intrigued to be able to do it with my iPhone now. You know, I, I have to say that I, 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 I am a, I, um, I don't, uh, 
I don't really, and this is evidently a common thing that happens when you get a big green egg, uh, is that is that I don't think of my big green egg as my barbecue. I think of it as the oven. Like, I mean, if I'm going to cook something, that's the only place I cook it. And um, and I'm on morning meetings. My morning meetings are usually when I'm on the phone. I'm sitting there uh, scraping the big green egg and preparing it for the evening, you know, to, to cook whatever we're going to cook. And the, the biggest problem I have is that is that my, uh, my wife and my kids can't eat meat as fast as I can cook it. So, um, uh, but the, uh, so... But the, what what makes that really work is the technology. It's it's being able to measure that heat because that's the only way to get really really great meat. That's all I got to say. You got to know exactly what temp, what the temperature is. And um, and so anyway, I know that that's a it's half of a commercial for a big green egg and half a commercial for eye grill. But but they're both great and they work. You know they complete each other. So Alex, um, you're, you're you're missing a trick here if you don't find a way to to, to work in a plug for Omaha Steaks. Because, you know, you've already, you're, you already got like two companies that will probably send you free stuff now. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get free stuff from either one of them. But okay. but the uh, but I would like to get I would like to mention. Omaha not with States that attitude, Hubbard. you're not going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, um, I would like to say how much I like Omaha steaks. And, uh, you know, anyway. anyway so. I'm really trying to resist making a joke about a big green egg world keynote by Steve Kebabs. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that's all i gotta say justin where can people find you all right so uh you can find me at uh, secondgearsoftware.com if you want to check out the apps or you can be my friend at twitter.com slash justin and uh andy uh where can where can people where's the best place for people to uh to find you uh somewhere in the middle of the snow uh grinning maniacally like jack nicholson after failing to kill my family with an axe it's really <laughs> snowing a lot over here guys I've, I've, i'm starting i'm starting to really not like it uh or but web web wise you can go to uh, anatco.com or www.cwob.com and aaron uh, where can people find you you can buy my book at amazon <laughs> iphone programming the big nerd ranch guide um i BigNerdRanch.com is the website. We have a class on iOS starting on February 21st. We have another one on March 12th. Uh, we do consulting, and we're always hiring. So if you're smart and hardworking, send us a resume. Jobs at BigNerdRanch.com. And I can personally vouch for the for the class. It is awesome. Uh, me and me and a couple of our folks uh, sat through it, as many of you know, and uh, and it, it it was great for us. What we're doing is we're preparing to to build apps. We're not planning to write them, but we needed to get our head around it and we needed to get it. In. And if we were planning to write them, this was the perfect thing for us to get into it. And there was a lot of people that were uh, there to start programming for us. It was just important to get our head around what was required and what the, what, 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 could, what it could, what it could do. And I think the book is a great way to start because it's really what the, you know, the class is based on, but it's, but, the, but there's a lot in the class that is not in the book. You know, right. and I can vouch for the books because the gentleman in the cowboy hat has taught me everything I know. Hey, Justin, is that one of my books on the shelf behind you? Um, if you look, my friend, all three of your books are back there. The Coco <laughs> programming, the advanced Mac OS X programming, and the iPhone programming. All right. I was just asking. Can I have a free cowboy hat? <laughs> For sure. All right. <laughs> all right. So uh, until, uh, until next week, get back to work. Break time is over. <laughs>